welcome. Thank you for joining us. We'll get started in just a few, um, maybe like one minute. We'll just allow time for people to come in. Thanks again. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this Saturday morning. We have a really cool show for you today. We're going to be um, going over the tour of our joint water pollution control plant, which is our largest wastewater treatment plant, largest out of our 11. And then stick around for after the tour, we're going to be taking um, another tour, a mini tour of our Bixby marshland, our freshwater marshland that we have on JWPCP property. So it's really exciting. Um, before I get into before I get into the speakers that we have today, just a few little house rules. If you guys have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. It's located at the bottom of your screen. Down there, you'll see the little chat icon and it says Q&A. So please use that or you can also use the raised hand option and then we can call on you so that you can ask your question live. Um, and with that, well, I'd like to introduce our speakers. We have Steve Cry. Uh, there you go. Yeah, he's waving. So we have Steve Cry. He's the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant Manager. So make sure you prepare your best questions for him. He can answer them all. I hope, fingers crossed. And then we have the fabulous Wendy Wirt, um, our senior engineer in the Public Information Office. And then she'll be giving you the walkthrough tour of the Big Speed Marshland. So I'm very excited. We have a really cool tour for you today. Um, so we're going to start off with um, the joint plant. We're going to do something different this time, do a little behind the scenes walkthrough tour of the joint plant. So we really hope you like it and stay tuned because we'll also be taking a poll at the end um, so that we can get your feedback. So with that, I will stop talking and I will hand it off to Steve Cry. Take it away. Okay. Thanks a lot, Genesis. And thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we'll be doing a virtual tour, as she said, of the Sanitation District's Joint Water Pollution Control Plan, and then we'll follow that with a tour of the Bixby Marshland. Uh, since we couldn't do a, um, an in-person bus tour today, we have some video from various parts of the plant to give you a closer look at things. So about 85% of our wastewater is from residential uh, sources, such as from your kitchen sink, showers, toilets, and washing machines. And the other 15% is from commercial and industrial sources such as refineries, paper mills, plating and dyeing companies, breweries, and other industrial sources. So here's our mission statement. Our treatment plants have evolved into resource recovery facilities. Currently, we actually reuse about 25 million gallons per day of clean water on site here. And since 1962, the districts has been recharging groundwater with clean water at, that's been produced at our upstream water reclamation plants. Um, and then also I wanna mention one other thing um, that we didn't mention at the beginning was uh, we have lots of uh, interesting things going on with the sanitation districts. And if you go to our YouTube page or our website, you can find um, links to um, numerous tours on food waste, on our energy recovery, um, our clear water tunnel project, um, uh, our pure water Southern California project, uh, lots of interesting things going on. So sanitation districts were formed in the 1920s to build the sewers and this plant to collect and treat wastewater in the LA region and to protect the public health by keeping raw sewage off the streets and sending clean water to the ocean. So this uh, schematic here shows our, um, our map, shows our service area, locations of our wastewater treatment plants. Uh, the white numbers there show you the, the numbers of the sanitation district areas um, and basically, we serve five and a half million people. Or about five million people are served here in um, the LA Basin, what we call the joint outfall system. And then up in the Antelope Valley, we have two plants, Lancaster and Palmdale, that serve about 300,000 people. And then in the Santa Clarita Valley, uh, Valencia and Sagas each serve about 300,000 people. Um, as far as the size of these plants, uh, Valencia is about 14 million gallons. Sagas is treating about 6 million gallons a day. Um, Lancaster and Palmdale are each treating about 12 million gallons per day. Uh, but the bulk of this presentation, we're gonna be talking about the uh, joint outfall system and specifically the joint water pollution control plant. Um, and this, this uh, system treats about 380 million gallons per day. Uh, 250 million gallons per day is treated at the, the joint plant. And then um, 
another 130 million gallons per day spread among the other plants. And you can see the blue lines, those show that our main trunk sewers um, that we own and maintain. And then the other interesting thing about this system is all the solids that are produced and taken out um, from the water when it's cleaned at these upstream plants gets put back in the sewers downstream of the plant. So all the solids flow to the joint water pollution control plant. So, so we do all the solids processing uh, down here in Carson. So how does our sewage get to a treatment plant? Um, the sanitation districts, as I said, we own and operate and maintain um, many miles of sewer, about 1,400 miles of large diameter trunk sewers. And then the individual cities and public works departments take care of these smaller um, laterals that connect into the large system. We also have an extensive industrial waste pretreatment program that requires um, industries to do pretreatment, take out heavy metals, volatile organic compounds, um, and other contaminants at the industrial sources before they uh, discharge into our system. So over here on the right here, we've got um, a few videos I'm gonna show where we can learn a little bit about sewers. So we've got a pipe display here that has an electrical display and a lot of different pipes that we use in our collection system. And you'll notice in this one here, you'll see a lot of corrosion. So this is something we're concerned about with a lot of our pipes that are 60, 70, even 80 years old. You can see the, the rebar exposed here and, and the aggregate. And if you look up at this pipe, this is what it would have looked like originally with the nice clear concrete. But the, the hydrogen sulfide, when the gas comes up in the head space, there's bacteria that convert it to sulfate, and that sulfate and water create uh, sulfuric acid, which then is what eats away the concrete. So in all our new pipes, what we're doing is we put this uh, plastic liner plate to protect the sewers. We also use clay pipes for more shallow um, installations. And the clay, the advantage of that is that it's um, resistant to the acid, so you don't see any corrosion in that type of pipe. These pipes here, these are examples of how we repair a pipe that's corroded like that one over here. This is a 78-inch pipe. Yeah, it was all corroded and then they slip lined it with this 72 inch pipe here and this is actually a pipe a liner it's fiberglass which is resistant to the acid but it's also much smoother so even though it's smaller diameter we're able to get um, virtually about the same amount of flow through the same um, through the same pipe uh, we've got an example of what the fiberglass liner looks like just out alone and this shows um, this shows uh, the white here and we'll have a video of that later for you that shows um, how the crown spray is put on and that's actually magnesium hydroxide that's the white coating here and that's what we do on our sewers is we spray the top of, of these sewers where they corrode and that prevents um, the corrosion from getting any worse until we can get in and repair the pipe so that's a sample of our pipes here um, for the collection system All right and then um, now we're gonna look at uh, one of our sewer maintenance crews um, and they're set up doing some work here. And um, this is using a vector truck. There's a lot of the different attachments here. They're actually cleaning out a lot of the rags and grease balls and things out of the sewer. You can see this um, device that they use to, to clean the sewer with. Um, there's a close up of the uh, rags there. Um, putting it back down in the sewer. This uh, large aluminum pipe here is actually a, a vacuum pipe. So it's actually vacuuming up um, balls with this lodge there. Um, you notice it's right in the middle of the street. It is, it is one of the um, riskiest uh, parts of the job for these guys. They have to spend a lot of time learning about uh, traffic control, and making sure it's safe to uh, set up there in the street. So if you do see these guys working, please try and be aware as you drive by panel they use there. And here's a close-up shot down in the sewer. You know, this is a live sewer uh, with flow flowing through and they're, they're in there cleaning up out debris that's accumulated. This is a close-up down there of the, the um, blockage that was in there with the uh, oil and grease. And we've got a, a cutter head with a high pressure nozzle that's breaking up the, uh, the, the accumulated grease ball there. You see it breaking through there. And we're using a CCTV camera upstream that sits there so they can see what they're doing. All right, then the next one here is um, our crown spray. Oops, let me back up a sec here. 
This shows our crown spray. We're actually upstream with the video watching this and it's spraying that magnesium hydroxide on the, the top of the sewer. If you watch real closely where my pointer is, you'll see that the uh, white is uh, gradually moving up the sewer there. So we're, we're working from downstream to upstream. Um, the crown spray device is on a raft that floats on top of the sewer there, uh, sewage water that's flowing. And then you can see the spray, their spray nozzle spraying the magnesium hydroxide on the, the ceiling there. And that protects the sewer um, and prevents any additional corrosion until we have time to go in and actually um, um, do a, a permanent repair of the sewer. You can see it moving along there. Hey, Steve, and we have a question. Are they cleaning normal buildup or stuff that people shouldn't have put down the sewers? Um, great question. Um, it's, uh, in most cases, it's, it's normal buildup. Um, so it's like a yes and yes <laughs> answer because it, it's a normal buildup, but it's also a lot of people when they cook, they, um, they use like hot water to break up the grease and get it down into the sewers. And then when it gets in the sewers and cools, it it um, congeals and, and sticks to the sewer. So we uh, prefer if you, you just put it in like a, a can and put it in the trash, um, something like that versus uh, washing grease down the, the sewer. But um, yeah, it's normal buildup. Um, any other questions? This is probably a good place to stop if there's any questions on the sewers. Uh, nope, that's it for now. Thanks. Okay. So we'll move on here. Um, we're going to look uh, behind the scenes of where your sewage goes and, and how it's treated and how it flows through the plant. So um, we're going to use this schematic here today. Um, the blue uh, shows how the water flows through the plant. And then the um, brown shows kind of how the solids flows through the plant. And as you see up at the top here, we're, we're going to break it down into two main areas, primary treatment. Um, there's a few unit processes, but the bulk of it is primary sedimentation, settling tanks where we slow the water from about three feet per second to three feet per minute and um, allow about 75% of the solids to settle out. Um, from there, it gets pumped to secondary treatment, which is a biological process. Uh, we add oxygen, it's aerobic microorganisms here. And um, that's where the remaining solids and a lot of the dissolved organic material is also removed. Um, and then any um, solids then, that are removed then get sent to digesters for anaerobic digestion. Um, we produce gas there, which we use for um, power to power the plant, so we're energy self-sufficient, and any excess we export to the Edison grid. And then uh, the left side here, the uh, solids go to centrifuges for dewatering and then get hauled off-site um, for reuse off-site. And we will start um, just with a quick display here we've got in our plant. On the so we stopped here just to show you, give you a feel for how big these sewers really are where we come into the plant here. I'm about six feet tall, six one. As you can see, these are pretty massive sewers. You could uh, basically drive a car through. So the first step of the process after the sewers is the bar screens. And these are one inch wide. Um, bars set at the front of the plant. And they've got these um, chains on the side with rakes that go around and then push up any material uh, larger than an inch will get caught on these, these screens. Um, you can see one that's pulled out to do some repairs on. You can see how dirty it is from all the, the rags and um, you see plastic material, uh, condoms, fem feminine hygiene products, um, anything that can fit through a, a manhole lid or get flushed through a sewer. Um, we've seen um, you know, we've seen tires, mattresses, uh, a lot of surprising things over the years. So this is our public surface announcement. Uh, please don't flush uh, wipes down the sewer. Uh, the, the disposable wipes do not break up um, like toilet paper. So please don't flush the wipes, even if the box says flushable. Okay, so we're gonna move through uh, the treatment process here. We've got some videos for you. We're gonna start, um, on the, uh, with the bar screens here. Okay, so now we're down at our inlet works here and these are our bar screens. And we've got three on each main sewer that comes into the plant. And as it comes in here, these rakes remove the screen, the screen material. And if you look in, you see 
be able to see one of the rigs coming up here. We wait just a moment. You can see the These are one inch wide gaps on the screens. Well, actually, you can see the, the rig going back down to the bottom to scoop some more material up. See a lot of that rag material there. And now you can see this rig pushing the material up. You notice most of it, it's mostly rags. We always talk about just the three P's down the drain, P, poop, and um, paper. Okay, and then after our bar screens here, um, you know, it's a gravity system for the most part. Um, we do have about uh, 40 or 50 pump stations spread throughout the county at low points to lift water up and over um, a low point or a hill. Um, so it can continue to gravity flow to this plant. But then when it gets here, um, we have inlet pumps and we actually have one that we've taken out of service for preventive maintenance and overhaul. And uh, we've got some video of that for you here. So actually we're here, we're rebuilding um, one of our inlet pumps. Um, you see the pieces are taken apart here. They've uh, refurbished and um, taken care of some damaged sections, welded more uh, metal in where it needed to be, recoated some things. Um, you see the casing and the housing over here. Um, and then over on the pallet here, we've got the impeller. That's uh, basically the propeller that lifts the water. You've never seen one of those. All right, so that was our pump. And then now we uh, move into our aerated grid chambers. All right, we're on the back side of the um, bar rakes here and everything gravity flows to this point and then we have inlet pumps that lift the water so it can then gravity flow through the rest of primary treatment. But before it gets to the primary sedimentation tanks, the next step in the process is our grid chambers, and you guys are in luck today because we actually have one that's out of service for maintenance. And you can see the hoppers down at the bottom there. That's where the, the grit, sand, and rock settle out. And then from there, it gets pumped out and dewatered. Um, if you look at the top here, we've got um, these swing arms actually pivot, and our these diffusers go down in the bottom. It's an air header, so it's blowing air up in the bottom of the hopper, and it creates a circular motion in there and that sends the grit and sand rock to the bottom and it keeps the lighter organic material in suspension to head on to the sedimentation tanks. All right, so we went from the grit chambers there, now we're gonna flow into the sedimentation tanks. All right, so we're here among our sedimentation tanks. We actually have 52 of these. This is where the bulk of primary treatment takes place where the solids settle out um, to the bottom and the skimmings, the fats, oils, and greases flow to the top. And if you look in this tank here, we're doing an inspection. Um, you can see the chain and the flights. There's flights moving along the bottom that are pushing the solids to a hopper at one end. And then just coming into your picture now on the top is uh, another flight that pushes the, all the floatable materials to the other end to a skimmer. And both the skimmings and the uh, solids that settle out, that's what gets pumped to the digesters for digestion. All right, so um, that was basically the primary treatment process. Um, the next slide we're going to look here is um, odor control. And probably um, one of the most odorous areas of the plant is, is primary treatment. And that's why if we were going to do a, a, like a tour through the plant, everything's covered, sealed. Um, so you can't really um, see a lot of what's inside underneath. Um, so we're going to show you the odor control and how we um, treat the odors here. All right, we're next to our um, order control station here for those sedimentation tanks that we looked at. Um, we've got big blowers here. All this overhead piping, it's uh, for the foul air. If you look over here to the right, you've got um, each tank has a connection, which is pulling off the foul air. That foul air is then routed to biotrickling scrubber that neutralizes the sulfuric acid, or the, neutralizes the hydrogen sulfide, converts it to sulfuric acid 
and then from there it's routed to carbon scrubber for a final polishing step. Okay, so that was um, primary treatment and then we pump this uh, water then to secondary treatment and we're gonna look at uh, that here now. Oops. Try this again. Well, here we are on top of one of our reactors. We actually have eight reactors, each rated for 50 million gallons per day. This is where the biological process is, where the microorganisms uh, break down um, what's left and also the uh, soluble organic material. They feed on that and remove that from the water. So we use oxygen that's put into the headspace, pure oxygen, 98% pure oxygen. Um, underneath the gearbox over here, you see a gearbox underneath that. There's a big propeller blade, an aerator that's on the surface of the water and it keeps things stirred up and that's where the oxygen transfer happens into the water so that the microorganisms have the uh, oxygen they need to feed on the, uh, the water that's in there. Okay, so after the microorganisms are feeding on that primary effluent in the reactor, that then flows into clarifiers and we're gonna take a look at a clarifier here. Now we're on the um, back side of the reactor, the biological reactor, what we call the mixed liquor, the activated sludge flows into these reactors and then the microorganisms settle out to the bottom and we're, they're called clarifiers because it clarifies the water and we're left with the nice clean water on the top. And you can look in here, um, this is one that's out of service. Um, we're doing some preventive maintenance um, and you can see how the flight and chain is set up here. Um, the flight's at the top. Um, similar to primary treatment, they push the uh, any floatable material to one end to get removed and then on the bottom that's where the microorganisms are pushed to a hopper and then from that hopper then they go to a pump station and we call it return activated sludge. That's where all those microorganisms are then returned back to the reactor and we just keep reusing the same microorganisms to treat the water. All right. And then we're going to move on here. I've got a slide showing you the um, what's underneath that gearbox, the aerator that I had mentioned. Um, this turns and um, creates a lot of turbulence, and that's where the uh, oxygen transfer happens to provide the oxygen for the uh, microorganisms. And then the uh, um, oxygen, we get that from the ambient air. Um, ambient air is 21% oxygen. We uh, cool and liquefy the air in these uh, cryogenic plants. Um, they actually operate at negative 300 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and then we, it's basically a distillation column, just like what you see in the refineries, except just at very cold temperatures. Um, the, we separate oxygen and nitrogen based on their boiling point. Um, nitrogen's negative 321 degrees, uh, oxygen negative 297 degrees. So um, we're able to take the 21% oxygen in the ambient air, concentrate it up to 98% pure oxygen and use that in our process. So I mentioned the microorganisms, so we've got a little video of those for you too. Um, it's actually a live video. Uh, you can see the, uh, this is what's called a, a water bear. It's one of the organisms that uh, is in the mixed liquor, we call it, and, and feeds on the dissolved organic material. Almost looks like a little dolphin or something. See it feeding on some solids particles there. Okay, next we have a different type of microorganism. This is called a, a ciliate, and you can stock ciliate because you can see the stock here. Um, it, it's uh, connected to the flock, and then each of those, let's show you that again, each of those. Um, ciliates or little hairs are um, moving around there, pulling into their, I guess, the mouth area there, um, the um, liquid, and then they feed on that. And this is a free swimming ciliate, so it's using its um, um, little hairs on it to, to move around and feed on the, uh, uh, the food that's in the, in the water. You see a little baby one over there. It's amazing how technology has come. I remember 30 years ago, um, 
we just looked under these at these under a microscope and then now they've got um, these fancy microscopes that can take videos and, and pictures and all sorts of things. All right, so that is um, the water flow through the plant. So we've gone through primary treatment, secondary treatment, um, and we disinfect and then uh, we send the water out to the ocean, the clean water. Um, so this, Genesis, this is a good time to stop if anybody has questions on the, um, the water side of the process. Um, I can answer those now or we can just move on and I'll start to talk about the solids. Yeah, I have a few. Okay. Um, there was, I'll ask you a few. Um, okay, so there was an orange color at the bottom of some of the tanks that we saw in the videos. Was that rust or is that something else? Um, that's a great question. The um, orange is actually from iron. And um, as I mentioned, um, we do odor control here, but one thing we do in our upstream sewers is, um, that there's a lot of odors produced in the sewers as the um, the sewage goes anaerobic in the collection system. So one of the things we do is we add ferrous chloride, which is iron. Um, we add that to the sewers, and that combines with the hydrogen sulfide um, to neutralize that that odor and uh, keeps the odors down in the collection system. And so that's uh, what you see um, that little rusty color. It's it's from the iron that that we add for upstream odor control. Okay, thank you. And then the other question is, um, so it sounds like the microorganisms get reused. So my question is, do you ever get quote unquote newer and better microorganisms? Um, yeah, it's just like um, you and me, um, these microorganisms, they feed on, on the, the food that's in there and they, um, you know, like you or me, if we eat too much food, then we gain weight. Same thing with the microorganisms. Um, we'll grow microorganisms. So that's um, one thing I'll talk about here in a moment about how um, the excess um, microorganisms is what we call our waste activated sludge. And so we send that to the digesters. Um, and then these um, microorganisms have a retention time of about three or four days. So um, they're constantly um, you know, dying off and, and regrowing, dying off, regrowing. So um, but when we talk about reusing them, they settle out in the clarifiers and then they get pumped back around to the reactor. Okay, cool. And we have a lot of other questions, but I'll, I'll wait till later. You're gonna answer them in a bit. Okay, sounds good. All right, so um, now we'll talk about the uh, solids flow here and um, we'll start with a video. And here we're by one of our pump stations and it's a typical pump station. You've got connection into the wall next to a wet well where the, the liquid comes into the pump here. And then from the pump, it's then pumped to wherever it needs to be processed, whether it's over to solids processing for centrifuges or uh, pump to the digester for digestion, depending on which uh, solids wet well it is. As you can see there, we have a huge network of uh, underground tunnels um, where we have piping and pumps and things um, taking care of all the, the solids that come off the primary sedimentation tanks. There's solids. And then, as I said, um, solids coming from secondary. That all gets pumped to the digesters. Um, and that's an anaerobic process. And um, we will take a look at that now. All right. So here we're um, among our digesters. These are basically like big tummies. We've got 24 of these. Um, same bacteria that's in your stomach and your intestine. Um, it's breaking down the solid material. Um, about half of the material ends up in um, uh, being um, converted to gas. That gas we collect and then use in a power plant. Uh, but you can see about 15 to 20 feet of the tank above ground here. Uh, there's another 25, 30 feet below ground. These are huge three and a half million gallon tanks. Um, and like I said, they're breaking down the solids material. Um, it also stabilizes the solids, makes it easier for us to dewater, and then also reduces the amount of pathogens in the bile solids. Okay. 
So this slide just shows um, kind of the top of the digester, as you can see the, uh, you know, there's piping up here for the solids feed piping. Um, insulated piping is for steam piping for heating up the digesters. Uh, we also have some blowers up here. And um, as I said in the video, this is um, same bacteria that's in your stomach and your gut. So we heat them up to about 96 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Um, and then the gas that's collected, we use that gas to produce power and we're energy self-sufficient here. So we're actually able to save about $25,000 a day by not having to buy power. Okay, so we saw the outside of the digester. Um, we're actually in the process of cleaning one of our digesters. So we had the guys take a video for you and I'll show you that here. I am currently inside of the interior of digester six with Matt from the digester crew. He is using a high pressure effluent hose to clean while we pump down once pumping is complete, we will begin the necessary repairs on the diffuser tubes and shielding. Once finished, we will reseal the digester. Back up for just a sec. I wanted to show you guys something there. So, this, um, when he talks about diffuser tubes, that's what this, this is here. And that's what's, it's a static mixer for mi mixing the digester. We, we uh, use the blower to push gas down in here to about halfway. And then the gas bubble goes up and it creates a, a mixing motion. And that's how the digester is mixed. These other, um, uh, I guess, columns are supporting the roof. That's what those are, concrete columns. Okay. And then we'll move on to this. Let's go back. Sorry, got stuck here. Let me back up a sec. Okay, so we um, just looked inside the digester, so you got to see what that was. And then uh, our next stop is uh, the boiler house, where we produce the steam. All right, so the next stop here is our boiler house. And we actually, we're doing maintenance on one of these too. We've got it opened up so you can see inside and see the tubes. Uh, if you're not familiar with the boiler, it just takes, um, it's got a burner that produces heat and then that boils off water to produce low pressure steam. Our fuel in these boilers is from the uh, digesters, the digester gas we use as our fuel here. And then the steam that's produced, the low pressure steam, we then route that back to the digester and use that to heat the digesters to keep the digesters about 95, 96 degrees. Okay, and then after the digestion process, the solids are about 2% solids concentration. So um, we take it over, pump it over to digest, or I'm sorry, centrifuges. And from there, we, we dewater um, to about 29, 30% concentration. All right, so we're in our centrifuge building here. This is where we take the solids, the digested solids from the digesters that are about 2% solid content, and we use a centrifuge, which basically is like your washing machine in the spin cycle where it separates the solids and the water. So we get up to about 29, 30% solids in the biosolids. We call it cake because it looks like moist chocolate cake. And we use centrifuges. We've got one opened up here so you can see what it looks like. Um, we've got the bowl here, and we turn it about 3,000 RPM to separate out the uh, solids in the water. Uh, you can see the inside of the control panel over there, they're doing a little movement today. And then if you look around to the right here, you can see we've got numerous other machines in the building here. So we're going to head out to see what this cake looks like. going down to the lower level. These centrifuges are up on the top level, our platform, and the cake drops onto conveyor belts on the bottom side here. And then the water, actually we call it centrate, is what goes into these pipes here. And that centrate goes into the pipes and then flows back to the front of the plant where it gets processed again. So these conveyor belts, they 
drop the solids material, the biosolids cake, and take it out of the building here. And we're going to see a sample of that here. You can see how it looks like moist chocolate cake there. And from there, it gets conveyed with these conveyor belts. It drops into the hopper and then goes up to the silos, which are back behind us here. And you'll see here shortly, up into the silos. And again, similar to primary treatment, you see the overhead piping there. That's all odor controlled ducting for the biosolids with the foul air gets drawn off the conveyor belts to try and minimize the odors as much as possible. Okay. So here's another view of those, that biosolids cake. And um, we basically were producing about 1,200 uh, tons per day of this uh, biosolids cake that's, uh, and you can see it's, it's moved with the conveyor belts around the plant. And then it, we use conveyor belt to put it in a um, truck for hauling off site. And um, I'll show you a video of that here. We're here at Solids Processing. This is one of our truck loading stations. You can see the uh, truck being loaded this morning. Um, there's about 50 trucks a day hauling the biosolids out of this site, and it's sent to reuse at different uh, locations throughout Southern California. Okay, and then um, I think, as I mentioned in there, it, it, we do have odor control over here at Solids Processing. It, next to the primary treatment is very odorous, so we have a lot of odor control there, but then also out here at um, Solids Processing, we have a lot of odor control. It's a different type of uh, odorous compound, though. It's more ammonia and mercaptans, dimethyl disulfide, things like that. So it's a different uh, odor control um, treatment process, and I've got a video of that for you here. Okay, this stop is for our uh, odor control for biosolids, and um, it's a little different treatment process from what we use in primary treatment. This is a biofilter process, and if you look at it, we've got um, compacted clay material. Uh, there's a lot of surface area there, and a, a we keep this moist and wet with sprinklers, and a biofilm grows on that, and then the bacteria actually do the work for us and neutralize the odorous compounds um, so that we just have clean, fresh air coming out. Okay, and then the last slide I'm going to show you here um, just shows um, the cost to operate this plant and the joint outfall system, and that also includes the collection system. So, um, but it's one of the most cost-effective systems in the country. Um, it's about thirty dollars a month, um, includes the local charges and the ad valorem tax uh, contribution. Uh, we have about three hundred fifty employees here at the plant um, in maintenance and construction electrical and instrumentation, um, laboratory operations um, with the operators, and then also um, engineering administrative staff. So that was a quick overview of the plant and its processes, a look behind the scenes at a few things. So um, I guess this is a good time. If there's any questions, Genesis, we can answer those. Yes, we have, we have quite a few. So don't forget to stick around. We have another little mini tour of the Bixby Marshland, which is also on joint plant property. So Wendy will be giving us a quick overview of what makes a marshland, how our mar what our marshland looks like, and all the really cool, fascinating birds that you can see when you go. There are some stunning photos there. So um, I'm going to ask questions, and then at 9.45, we'll move on to, the, to Wendy's portion. So I'm just going to stop your, uh, oh wait, I stopped. I was gonna stop your screen share. And uh, where is it? I don't have it here. I can stop it. Okay, cool. I see a little late. Okay. All right, so first question you have. All right, so a few questions. Um, you have a lot of love, first of all. <laughs> um, the screen has been popping with little emoji reactions on hearts and applauses and stuff like that. So thank you, everyone. We're so glad to see that you guys are just as fascinated by all of this as we are. Um, it's pretty cool. And thank you for the love. All right, so moving on to the questions. So how often do you clean those diffuser tubes? Um, that, I'm assuming that's asking about the digester um, diffusers. 
and the, the draft tubes. Yeah, that's um, about every eight years. We have 24 of them, so we it takes about uh, three or four months to clean one. So we try and do three a year. So every eight years, eight to 10 years. Cool. Um, does the JWPCP have employees 24 seven or as much as or as much of that process automated? Um, we do have employees here 24 seven. Um, we have a, a day shift, a swing shift, and a graveyard shift. It's, um, and um, yeah, the water keeps flowing in. And so we take care of it. We also have a, um, we do have a lot of the process automated. So it's, um, you know, that's allowed us to, to reduce the um, number of operators we need over the years. Um, you know, we've had a lot of uh, equipment. As you saw out there, there's a lot of uh, interesting um, complex um, equipment to, to treat the water. And um, so to, to do that, um, if we did it all manually, it would take uh, probably three times as many operators as, as what we have. So um, we've got an extensive distributed control system where um, there's instruments throughout the plant that tell the operators uh, flow rates, uh, temperatures, pressures, um, all sorts of information that they can use to, to make sure that the op operation is, is running smoothly. So, but, but you still need somebody here to monitor it. Um, they also have rounds that they do in the plant where they go around and um, check things, look for leaks, um, you, know, um, you know, if a gearbox or a motor is making noise, um, that might be an indication of um, um, bearing starting to go bad or something. So, so you, you, you can never get, get rid of the human factor. You need people that can, um, you know, look, listen, smell, um, hopefully not taste, but. <laughs> Uh, out there in the plant. Hopefully. All right. Cool. Thank you. So, next question we have two questions regarding uh, the anaerobic process. What does anaerobic mean in regards to the digesting process? Um, that's just a word that means no oxygen. So, aerobic would mean you have oxygen present. That's our secondary process, is aerobic means they need oxygen for those mi microorganisms to survive. Um, anaerobic, it's different type of microorganism that does not need oxygen um, to, to breathe. They, they use other, other things to get um, yeah, their, um, to do their, their work. Awesome, and then next one is, is the anaerobic digester gases used to power the generators on site? Yes, it's uh, the gas that's produced from the digester is about 65% methane, 35% carbon dioxide, and um, we use gas turbines to produce uh, power, um, and it uses that gas as a fuel. And could you elaborate for us how the the biosolids? What happens to those biosolids after? Um, we've got um, a number of different uh, reuse sites where we take the material. Um, the Majority of it goes to composting, um, where it's composted with wood chips and then reused as um, fertilizer for on farms. Um, we have um, you can also do land app direct land application. Um, we had a site out in Arizona where we were doing that, where you add the biosolids to the um, the dry dry fallow soil out there. Um, the biosolids has moisture. It's got um, iron, as I said, um, but it's also got um, the nitrogen um, and other nutrients, phosphorus that um, the, the plants like and, and can use to, to grow crops. Um, and then a portion does go to landfill also. All right, so, okay, we have time for, I think one more question before we have to jump on to the mini Bixby Marshland tour. Um, so what kind of monitoring is there for you to know where the blockages are? And this came in when we were talking about the jetter truck. Um, okay. Um, well, at strategic locations in the collection system, the, um, we've got instrumentation in the um, level sensors in the, underneath the manhole lid that can tell us the level of sewer. And, and Usually that's an indication of the level is, if it starts to go up is an indication of a blockage downstream. So um, that's what they use. Um, we also, you know, do a lot of uh, preventive maintenance where we do um, 
routine inspections and, cl and cleanings of the, the sewer uh, to make sure that um, we don't have any blockages. <laughs> so that's the last thing we want is for something to, to block the sewer and then back up and, and spill on the street. Yeah, thank you so much. And there are a lot of other great questions. So um, please stick around for after the tour. Um, we're gonna be covering, you know, about, we're gonna be covering questions such as joint plant hiring, wastewater operator trainees. We're gonna be covering um, education paths and how you got into this field. We'll be covering the microorganisms, where they come from, and a lot of interest in what happens to that water. Um, once it leaves our plant and what kind of plans we have to reuse that water. So a lot of cool stuff that we'll be covering after. But first, um, let's take a walk through the Bixby marshland with Mrs. Uh, Wendy Wirt. Well, thank you. And join me in thanking, wow, Genesis Rodriguez and Steve Cry for that behind the scenes look at our joint plan in Carson. One of the advantages of these broadcasts is that we get to see things we can't easily access. So let's continue with a brief introduction to the Bixby Marshland located right next to the plant you just toured. I'm Wendy Wirt a district's engineer and your guide for this tour. So this marshland is a bit hidden. It's a gem and with if you're not looking for it, you might not find it. So just to get our bearings, this is the 110. This is uh, Sepulveda and we're gonna jump in and enter off of Figueroa. So what it, does Bixby do for our community? Marshlands help to protect our region's resources. They're home to 43% of federally listed species, but that's not all they do. They provide for the survival of these resident and migratory birds that we're gonna see today. So Marshlands also, we heard a whole lot from Steve about the innovations that are out at the joint plant for water quality. And the marshland that you're gonna see today is really part of that story, that water quality story. They filter pollutants, they recharge groundwater, and as we've become aware of even more recently, they help us to sequester greenhouse gases. So how did the sanitation districts get involved in this marshland? Well, here's what we had in 1995. And as we looked towards our future to plan for the needs of the community, we saw this opportunity to recreate a natural resource. So we couldn't have done it. And this is why it's just so wonderful that you're all here today, because where we get our valuable ideas and our input is from the communities that we serve. And in particular, I want to do a shout out to the Joint uh, Plant Citizens Advisory Committee. They provided valuable input and you're going to see the result. We also hired experts and this is the resulting design. Just as we get started, I want to show you what we're going to see um, on this schematic here. So we're going to start in our parking lot. We're going to walk over to our education pavilion and as we go through you're going to see all of the different zones and the different types of habitat that live in those zones. We'll see open water across this bridge. We'll explore the source of the water that comes into our marshland, which is the Wilmington drain. Then we'll double back. We'll go back through here and then we'll look at meadowlands and uplands. So let's get out there and do it. Um, the What I wanna do just one more, one more slide as we get going is to look at, I love this in particular because because it's basically the Bixby Marshlands baby picture. This was back in 2009. So the Marshlands, as of um, it started uh, July 16th is when we opened. So it's 13 years old last month. So a very accomplished teenager. You're going to see it grew up quite a bit since it's, it's baby picture. But we're going to explore the different zones. So a lot of thought, I, I mentioned community input, a lot of thought went into the design of this marshland so that we could provide as much habitat as possible within the 17 acres. So you're going to see open water. You're going to see wetlands. You're going to see riparian, which is a fancy way to say that transitional zone between the wet areas and then your drier meadowlands and uplands. 
All are important and all support different uh, vegetation and also creatures. So you saw the beginning, and as you can see, over the last 13 years, a lot has changed. So let's get out there and let's start in our parking lot. So even our parking lot, now this drone footage, I do want to mention to you, um, I've cobbled together some things from some footage from a number of different broadcasts. And so this, this footage was taken in the fall. You can see the Tory pine and you can also see the willow. So you see some of that coloring from the fall. Tory pine is a native, everything out here is a native to California. And the Tory pines are in San Diego, only about 4,000 in the wild. And here you see this bridge. We're going to get down there and explore. And you see these different zones. You see the open water, the uplands, the wetlands, the riparian area. The lighter yellow color would be the willow trees. We'll get a closer look at those as we go through. But we do have 124 of those pine trees here in our marshland. So as you can see, our parking lot provides habitat for this extraordinary little creature. This is an Anna's hummingbird. They're the, among the most common along the Pacific coast, but they're anything but common. And here you can see just a little bit of overflow. You see how valuable the water is just a little bit of overflow from a sprinkler and the pavement and she has a bird bath and a shower and the reason she wants to stay close to the parking lot is because these tory pines are are hosting her children <laughs> her, her chicks are located in um in this tory pine and this photograph I, I would never have seen them without our docents and without our volunteers. Vincent Lloyd pointed it out to me, the size of a golf ball and made with the cobweb, so soft and fluffy. And, and it used to know how little a hummingbird is. You can imagine how tiny her chicks are. So we're going to continue walking through um, those 124 Tory pines. You're going to see the California coastal sage vegetation and how it has grown through. So we're leaving that parking lot and we're walking over in the distance. You can see our education pavilion. We'll get a closer look at it. There is that Tory Pine, they on their own with 124 of them are able to, to sequester um, 2,400 pounds of carbon dioxide. And here you're looking at that native California coastal sage uh, scrub. And so when you're out there, how Steve talked about some of the, the odors that we have, well, out there at the marshland, you're going to have fragrances and uh, really just beautiful. It does excite all of the senses. So here you're seeing one of those willow trees is closer up. This is in that riparian zone or zone three that was designed very specifically. They grow so fast, 10 feet in a single year. So you can imagine how tall they are out there if it's 13 years old. 60 arroyo willows, but we didn't stop there. We also planted another 84 red willows and 85 black willows. So for those of you who are keeping track, we're up to 13,500 pounds of carbon dioxide sequestered so far, but we're going to do more. Now, I love this photo because here's what that education pavilion looked like. You, you saw Saw that ground level tour, that footage that Genesis took, just wonderful, that got you over to the education pavilion. But here's what it looked at, like when it was first planted. So beautiful. But what you're going to see is that with the community, we removed those um, non-native, such as eucalyptus, which were planted. But as a sanitation agency, we repurposed it, right? Converting something into a resource. And you're gonna see that as we walk through. So here's this beautiful ground level footage. You can see more of that California coastal sage scrub. And there it is. There's our education pavilion now, even with uh, some places for students to study and do water quality tests. And here's that beautiful um, California desert grape. So let's a closer look at that. These pictures, I had to do a shout out here. These pictures were provided by Kim Moore, um, volunteer and nature photographer extraordinaire. Uh, we talked, uh, Steve told us we shouldn't be tasting things. <laughs> 
uh, the treatment plant. At the marshland, you kind of can. Um, when we were out there last week, these grapes are ripe. And so, you know, we, we want to leave them for the birds. We want to leave them for the, the wonderful wildlife that they attract. But it, it's okay to, to taste the grapes when you're out there. So other parts of the coastal sage scrub are that attract wildlife. This is just beautiful. This is a California rose, native of course. And if you look really close, that's why when you go out there, you gotta be kind of quiet and, and spend some time because you'll see this is a flower fly. So if you look really closely at her, you're gonna see that it has this yellow as well as black stripes, almost like a bee, but so much smaller than even the smallest hummingbee, this margin calligrapher and a wonderful pollinator. So as you can see, you can really see the difference in this. Both enjoy the nectar of the California rose out at Bixby, but you can really see the difference in the size. This yellow-faced bumblebee um, is also a, a great pollinator out there and really active. And you can hear kind of the humming and the music out there. Now I've given you a lot of information and what I wanna do now is I wanna give you a chance to breathe and to really look at the marshland and how all of those zones, a lot of design, a lot of thought, a lot of community input, but it comes together and you can, you can really see that out on that um, panorama. So if we go down closer onto the bridge, you can see how the marshland provides not only for resident birds, but also for migratory birds. And, um, and here, this Canada goose has decided to nest in the spring, and those are her goslings. So yet another photo from Kim. And this is just beautiful. Uh, this is mallard ducks. And the reason I like to look at the mallard ducks is because they're very representative of the types of species that need all of those zones that were carefully placed into this wetland. So as you can see, they need the open water to swim. They need that wetland area to forage and then the riparian area to lay their eggs. And these flame skimmers and these dragonflies, very similar life cycle. Their larval stage needs that open water. Then they go into the, the rushes and the tulies and they need that protection. So this is a male and once again beautiful photography from Kim. You can see the lace-like as you as you look at them closely, um, nature to their wings and then this is his mate. They were sitting there together but the photograph of them together you couldn't really see the intricacies so I kind of blew those up and, um, and here once again you can see that they have incredible vision. So they're starting out in the open water then they're climbing up onto the rushes, onto the tulies, and living their life in the marshland. So now we're going to go forward and explore the source of the water. So this is a freshwater marshland. So the source is the Wilmington drain. So the water comes in. So we're going to follow the flow. It comes in, and then it's in the, that zone five, that open water zone. And then we go into the wetland area at the edge here. And as it meanders through, it's getting polished, it's getting cleaned. A lot of it, most of it, in fact, infiltrates down into our groundwater basin, but some of it as it continues through is then cleaned by the, the rushes. And while it's being cleaned, it's also providing habitat. Um, so it's very important. You're gonna see the work that Steve's crew does um, out at the joint plant, just beautiful to maintain these zones. You can see that uh, we, we do need to remove some of the ve vegetation, in particular the um, the non-native vegetation, but even the native vegetation can grow and then it can change the, the different habitat zones. And so we wanna make sure we're, we're maintaining. And then that polished water can be returned to the Wilmington drain. You got a great view of it right there. So as we walk back along this path, so I said, we're gonna go explore the, the source of the water and then we're gonna 
double back and do some more walking along the riparian area. What you're going to see here in this vegetated zone is you're going to see these beautiful western tiger swallowtail butterflies. They live here. In fact, the sycamore trees are their larval host. Right now, this one is sitting on a native Californian, some, some mule fat that it's resting on. And so as we walk along this path, I want to point out, so I mentioned that tiger um, butterfly, and this is a sycamore tree, and it does provide the larval host for it. And so a lot of the questions that we get is, does it harm the tree, you know, these beautiful sycamore trees? And no, the, it's a, a symbiotic relationship that it has. So really wonderful. Another tree that you'll see in this area, and it was in the video as well, I didn't point it out, but here you see a cottonwood. So this is a Fremont cottonwood. It's well adapted to that riparian area. So at the districts, we were able to plant in the marshland 90 of these cottonwoods. So for those of you who are, I have my mathematicians out there, right? So we've got 5,000 pounds of carbon dioxide, another 5,000 with just the cottonwood trees, but that's not all the trees we have. We have 124 Torrey pines, 60 arroyo willows, um, 84 red willows, 85 black willow trees, and the 90 cottonwood trees. So we're up to 18,500 pounds. Now the cottonwood trees don't just sequester carbon. They help to provide habitat for these beautiful creatures. So here's a Fremont, one of those 90 Fremont cottonwood trees. And here we have this female, what a moment, right? This female great horned owl is resting. She's a resident. She lives there. This is her home at the marshland. She's a little underweight. Um, she's a female great horned owl. Typically, I like this too. Typically, the females are larger than the males. Um, but but I said, as I said, I mentioned, but she'll 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 fatten up just fine with all the wildlife that's out there. The reason that we were able to see her during the daylight is because they're such fierce predators that all those other smaller birds who they can tend to feed on um, did this one wonderful song, this warning call. And so we were able to, and it was Tracy Drake who, who made this photo, but we were able to zero in on her and she welcomed my, my 84 year old mother, who you'll see later, was able to, to see this uh, normally nocturnal bird, but during the, the daytime. So we're gonna, you know, complete our tour um, by visiting this. So I told you we double back along that path. Now we're going to the Meadowlands and the upland areas. And these are so exciting. The Meadowlands are, are fantastic because you get those desert cottontails out there. And those are, those are gonna be something that, of course, that beautiful owl um, can feed on. And it'll get, it'll get her real, real healthy. She's already healthy. But the point is, as you look out along this pathway, you're going to see those uplands in the distance. And those uplands are really where you see the, our birds of prey, these, these magnificent creatures. So this is not a fantastic picture, but it tells a story. So I wanted to include the female adult um, Cooper's hawk, because you're going to see a, a, one of the many sagas of life that unfolds. But this is a juvenile Cooper's hawk. Spots on his breast, and you're going to hear him, baby. I did some toggling with the volume, so I'm not quite sure, but he's calling out, and he's calling out to his mom because the juveniles don't like to hug on their own, and so he asks. And, uh, and so And so here's the, the closer shot. You can see that one eye um, is a little injured. He's talking to mom. He's asking her to feed him. You also notice the way he swivels his head. His eyes don't move in the socket like ours do, so he's got to turn his head side to side in order to zero in on something, probably his mother. So the reason I wanted to sort of switch is because the hawk that you just saw was resting in one of our sycamore trees. So we have 70 of these sycamore trees that can be found at the Bixby Marshland. Here we go 
with the numbers again, another 4,500 pounds of carbon dioxide sequestered with just the sycamore trees. They're providing that larval home for those beautiful butterflies and then a resting place for the Cooper's hawks. So we're up to 23,000 pounds of carbon dioxide sequestered annually and enough oxygen for more than a thousand people in just these 17 acres, but our story's not over. So here's our, our little guy again as we walk along that boardwalk and that pathway out there. And what you can see, this is the juvenile, and mom is like all moms, right? She couldn't help it. She, she sent him something, you know, like uh, our parents send us when we're at college, right? She sent him um, some food. But he's a sneaky little thing. Um, and this is typical behavior of hogs. He immediately starts screening. So you can see the foot of the, the bird that she tossed down to him. And he says, I want more. And of course, mom is, is very wise and she doesn't feed she doesn't feed him more. So he goes ahead and he eats um, what she fed him and he says, thank you. And here you can see, you know, having eaten and you can see that the bird that he consumed it almost looks like he has two beaks here you can see that the bird that he consumed is in his crop and he'll um, digest it and he'll release the remaining fur and feathers so he got fed and having eaten this young hawk went off to explore his homeland he grew up in bixby and he's going to continue to live here and he's not alone 193 other bird species who fly above and here we go the 124 tory pines 60 royal willows 84 red willows 85 black willows 90 cottonwood trees and 70 sycamore trees 23,000 pounds of carbon dioxide, enough oxygen for more than a thousand people and 17 acres, not able to do it without our volunteers. Um, you know, Al Sattler, district's retiree, volunteer extraordinaire, and the community that we serve. Um, we are so pleased to have have had an opportunity really to restore this environment. We can provide a home for plants and animals and improve water quality in our region. Visit us. It's good, you know, virtually, but it's better in person. We're open the um, first Saturday every month from eight to noon. And we have volunteers out there that know much more than I do about these things. We'll also open it up. This as I, I, I promised you, you know, we saw the, the mom of the Cooper's Hawk. So now you get to see my mom. She's out there at 84 years young, still learning, still teaching. And so with that, I am going to stop and open it up. And we're gonna take questions for, for the joint plant as well. But that's, that's it for my part. And hopefully, yeah, we, Genesis helped me stop share. She's so much more technically savvy than I am. Thank you, Genesis. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I hope you guys enjoyed that walkthrough and those stunning photos. Those are so cool, especially the dragonfly where you get to see the details of their little wings. It's awesome. Oh, and the little ducky swimming through the through the little pond is my favorite. Um, okay, so we got some burning hot questions for Steve. So Steve, prep up. Someone call Steve. Oh, he's here. Okay. So we got Steve here, uh, but just, you know, some of the Bixby questions that we got, you answered it at the end, Wendy, when you told us the vast, like all the species that we find at Bixby. So that's really, really cool. I didn't even know um, those. So that was really cool. And while we have our education expert, which is Wendy here, um, we have a question regarding that. Uh, well, one, is this presentation going to be available on your YouTube channel? Yes, we will be uploading it. It'll be up no later than Monday. So if you subscribe to our channel, I will put the link to our YouTube channel down in the chat. Um, it's just Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts 1. And if you subscribe, you'll get notified um, when the video gets posted. But yes, it'll be up there. And then, um, so she said, Julie says, I would like to share it with some science teacher friends. Do you have educational materials that you can provide to local school districts? I think they would be very popular with middle and high school teachers. Thank you, I learned a lot. Wendy, please tell us about our educational programs. 
Oh, wow. What a nice segue. So the, the short answer is that Julie, for her and for other teachers, is yes. Get in touch with us. I know that Genesis will put contact information in the chat, but we have programs for, for from kindergarten all the way through the college level. We have educational programs. We have resources. We have materials. We are a public entity. So all of the resources that we have are available for your use. If you have a school group, or even if you just have a group of friends and you'd like to tour the marshland, you're welcome. We also have students who go out into the marshland and do water quality tests. We also have a partnership with the marshland and our partnering agency over at the joint plant. There's so much that happens at Steve's joint plant. It's just it's astonishing. But with Metropolitan, there's a whole water journey um, that takes place that involves the marshland. So contact us and yes, we will provide you with resources for your schools. All right, awesome. Thank you so much, Wendy. And we hope to see everyone there at Bixby the next first Saturday of the month, which is going to be September 3. So I put the link in our in the chat, lacsd.org slash Bixby, where you can get more information, more photos, more instructions on how to get there. And of course, if you have any questions, you can email us at info at lacsd.org and we'll put you in the right direction. But we'll see you next Saturday at Bixby at 8 a.m. Okay, moving on to the burning hot questions that we have for uh, Mr. Steve Cry, Joint Plant Manager. <clears throat> We're gonna pick up where we left off. So. Um, let's see, where do, where do, where did we leave off? Um, what questions do we have for you? We have many. Um, okay, so first one that I will ask. Um, so people are interested in careers at the joint plant, and this one will also bring Wendy in later, so don't leave us yet, Wendy. No, she's not, she won't leave us yet. Okay, so does the joint plant hire wastewater operator trainees and how would you recommend someone to prepare to become a good operator? Um, yes, we do. Um, some large agencies, actually a lot of large agencies don't, but um, we are one that does um, do the operator trainees and um, we've got many new operators have, have started over the years. Um, the best way to prepare is um, there's a Sacramento State course, they call it the King Carry course, where you do uh, um, volume one, volume two of wastewater treatment, and then advanced water treatment, those courses, they're correspondence courses you can do. Um, local community colleges, uh, Santiago Canyon, Rio Hondo, um, have programs. Um, I think LA Trade Tech's got some um, programs too. Um, there's a, a lot of programs out there where you can um, take classes and learn things about um, wastewater treatment and how it works. And so that's always a good place to start. Um, we have our website where um, we post uh, job openings um, all the time. Um, we like to think this is a good place to work. We have many employees who have worked here for many years. In fact, we've got probably 20% of our employees are over 60 now. So we're gonna be having them retiring and meet a lot more employees here in the next four to five years. So, um, you know, we're always looking for good maintenance and construction staff with good technical skills, mechanical skills. Um, you know, we've got stationary mechanics, welders, painters, um, all sorts of things here on site um, to do. Um, I mentioned that whole distributed control system and controls and um, the power plant. So we've got um, electricians, um, instrumentation technicians, computer technicians, um, a, a lot of different careers uh, you can do here at the plant. Okay, cool. And thank you for that expensive, for that extensive uh... Yes, there's a wide variety of jobs. And that's just at the joint plant. We have a lot, you know, sanitation districts wide. And that includes jobs in finance, uh, whether that's budget and finance, whether that's accounting, purchasing. Uh, well, lab staff, we also have at the joint plant. Um, we have architecture design, GIS experts, um, public affairs as well. There's just, it's, it's insane. So I'm going to put the link for careers on there. And someone was asking um, about work for people with business experience and MBAs. I think the finance group would be a stellar place for you to work at. And again, there's GIS, there's environmental planning, there's a lot. And I'm going to put the link down in the chat. And it's a really cool place to 
it's a great place to work. Um, so check it out. And if you have any questions as well, you can email us at info at lacsd.org. So I'm looking at the other questions because there were some other ones related to it. Okay, this one's from Melissa. For the kids listening, can you share your education slash career training path and how you got into this field for your career? So we're going to start with Steve because we also have another question for Steve regarding the experience and background that you needed to become the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant Manager. So we'll go with Steve and then we'll we'll listen. Uh, we'll hear from Wendy. Okay. Yep. Um, well, believe it or not, I did not, I was not in elementary school looking out the windows thinking about work, working in a wastewater treatment plant. That that didn't happen. So um, but I went to school for chemical engineering. That was my undergraduate degree. And then I, when I moved out to California back in the 1980s, I was actually um, got interested in the environmental sciences and was looking at air quality and water quality. And so I went back to graduate school in civil engineering and um, then got a job with sanitation districts and kind of worked in solid waste for a few years at the landfills and then transferred over to the wastewater side. And I've been here ever since. Oh, that's fantastic, Steve. So I guess I go now. Um, I started out, I guess it's always a teacher, right? <laughs> So that's how it works for me. I guess it started um, a little bit in elementary school. We had a game, a, a, a teacher that did math counts and we made it into a competition. And so I got to be a mathlete since I, unlike Steve Cry, I wasn't an athlete. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I've told you about his whole other life, but um, but no, I I loved math, loved science, and then I was really fortunate. I was able to get a, a scholarship, a um, McClellan scholarship, which is a, a a person who was involved with the districts, and so I was very curious over um, who funded my education. <laughs> so that's that was kind of my first introduction to the districts. But it's a wonderful place to work, I guess. Um, after that, after when I was at college, like Steve, uh, you don't think to yourself, wow, I want to be, you know, wastewater or sewage uh, engineer. It's not something that you in immediately have a passion for, but it was the microbiology. And I think Steve did such a great job of showing you those incredible creatures. And once you see something like that and you recognize the power, you know, we talked a little bit about Bixby and the marshland um, and how the natural systems can then combine with engineering and with science and with technology. So just very exciting, but briefly my background, I know nothing about me is brief, <laughs> but um, so uh, after I, I started consulting, I consulted for the districts, I did a lot of research for the districts, and then I, I, I joined them directly. And for those of you who are thinking about a career in sanitation, no matter who you are, no matter what your background, I think we have the best jobs in Los Angeles County because we take something that's a waste that could be a hazard and we use the best available technology and turn it into, and your mind, the, the bright minds of all these incredible people. I got to stop talking. <laughs> no, that's great. That's, I always love asking this question because I get to learn even more about my own colleagues and their backgrounds and how they got here. So that's cool. And then for me, I, you know, I was kind of fresh out of college a bit. I was, you know, job searching as we all do. I knew that I wanted to work somewhere that had a positive impact on the environment. I came across a job opening at governmentjobs.com. I saw the sanitation districts. Once I did my research, I was sold, I applied, and then it's been history ever since. So governmentjobs.com is great. And then for more specific job openings that we have, visit lacsd.org slash careers. And we hope to see you with us soon. But enough about us. We have some more questions on the plant. Um, okay, so Steve, can you tell us um, about, well, one, why, we have a few questions on this. Why is water being sent out to the ocean? And what are your future plans? Are you looking, what are the plans to get the water 100% potable so that we reuse that wastewater instead of pumping it out to the ocean? Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
I didn't do it in this presentation, but I've done it in presentations in the past. But when I just briefly mentioned we did the water recycling upstream, and um, we probably recycle 80, 90, 100 million gallons per day at those um, upstream water reclamation plants. That water goes to, um, I think I saw a question in the chat about the city of Walnut Tank. And um, there, there's also groundwater recharge going on up there. And then a lot of the, you've seen the purple pipes, the recycled water sanitation districts does a lot of that throughout the LA basin. And even up in um, Lancaster and Palmdale, the, the effluent from those plants is used on the, the farms up there to grow crops. So um, we reuse a, lo a lot of the water here, but um, the greatest untapped source of water here in LA County is the effluent from this plant and the effluent from the Hyperion uh, plant in the city of LA. And there's plans um, at, at both agencies to um, look at taking that water and cleaning it up. Um, for our plant specifically, the um, main thing in, in our plant is we've got um, a lot of industrial discharges, as I said. So we have a high salt content, about 1,700 milligrams per liter versus uh, the residential uh, water has more in the 600, 700 milligrams per liter, which is fine for plants, but 1,700 milligrams per liter is not gonna work um, for grasses and other things where you wanted to reuse it and obviously can't drink that either. So, um, so to do um, reuse our water, you need to do another step of treatment. And um, so that's something we're working with Metropolitan Water District. It's a, a project called Pure Water Southern California. Um, we also have um, presentations on that. You can find that on our website that gives you more details on exactly how that project is, is gonna work. But ultimately the goal is 10 years from now, um, we would we would actually be reusing up to 150 million gallons per day of our effluent um, for groundwater recharge and potentially potentially even for direct potable reuse. Okay, so I thought you were gonna share, I thought you had a slide for us. With that. Um, I can watch the other present. You've got a lot of questions. I'd I'll set, answer. I'll put it in the, yeah, the, I know there are a lot of links cause we could, we could talk forever. So we'll put it, in the chat, the link to the um, the link to our Pure Water Southern California program that we have in partnership with the Metropolitan Water District. Okay, so why are companies selling wipes that say on the packaging that they can't be flushed? Isn't is that false advertising if they can't actually be disposed in the toilet? Uh, yes, and there's been numerous lawsuits going back and forth. And um, there was a case I think it was just about a year ago where. Um, because this isn't a problem just for LA County, this is throughout the world, the sanitation districts. In fact, if you Google London Fatberg, you'll see this huge ma massive blob that they pulled out of the, the sewers in London. Um, but anyway, the, um, the court case was decided in the favor of the sanitation agencies. So um, the white manufacturers are having to change their, their labeling so that um, um, hopefully uh, people won't um, be misinformed and be flushing the, the disposable wipes. They're, they they say they're flushable, which basically means it can get through your toilet and into the sewer system, but they don't break down like toilet paper. So uh, that's why we've had an outreach campaign about the three P's, um, only pee, poop, and paper down the, the toilet. Ooh, you just did a really cool segue for our next um, questions. But before that, um, I did put the, the link in the chat to the Regional Recycled Water Program. It's now known as the Pure Water Southern California Program. We have a really cool, fascinating uh, demo facility. Like Steve said, it's, it's purifying like half a million gallons of water per day. And at full scale, it'll be purifying 150 million gallons of water per day from the joint plant. So that's very exciting. That's all local source of water that will go back to the community. So you can check that website out to learn more about that program. We're very excited about it. We've been recycling water at all of our other plants, our 10 other plants we've been recycling and reusing. So we're very excited about our last frontier, which is the joint plant. But, okay, another um, thing before I forget, please, um, we value your feedback and we always wanna improve our tours. So while I ask the next questions, if you can please uh, fill out this, you know, hopefully brief, for a question survey. So I will launch that here while I ask the other questions. And of course, Steve and Wendy aren't allowed to answer, um, aren't allowed to answer their own questions, but okay. All right, so that's, um, okay, Steve. So you mentioned the three Ps and the segue to that is, you know, people are asking, 
what about the paints that they have when they clean their, you know, when they're painting a pretty portrait and they're disposing of that paint residue in the water or about oils? People are asking where they can dispose of these oils. And I have, I have the answer for that, actually. Um, so we have a really cool um, household hazardous waste and electronic waste program. Um, it's different. You know, we have different events throughout L.A. County throughout the year. Can I interrupt real quick? Can yeah, I, go for all it. Right. They're, they're saying the poll vanished on them. It, the poll disappeared or something. You must have clicked something to close it or something. Um, let's see. I think I still have the poll. OK, let me hold on one second. I probably. There you go. Let me relaunch. Well, well she's doing that. I'll, I'll talk about it. We've oh, got her. It's relaunched. Home. Household hazardous waste roundups throughout the county. Um, you can um, learn about those, and that's that's where your hazardous material should be disposed of. Uh, you really shouldn't be washing paints down the drain. Um, chemicals shouldn't be going down the drain. Antifreeze shouldn't be going down the drain. Um, should all be disposed of properly. So our household hazardous waste roundups. We're at different cities every single Saturday throughout LA County. Today we're actually out in Whittier. Uh, by Rio Hondo College. Next week, we'll be out in Baldwin Park, then Pomona, Alhambra, Burbank, and so on. These are all completely free. You can take any old computers, any old smartphones, sharps, old paint, oil. Um, there's batteries. a whole list. So I put batteries, yeah, car batteries. So I put the whole list in the chat. You can visit that website and um, yeah, visit the website, check out the list and find the next event nearest to you. We just confirmed our October events. So we'll be posting those by Monday. So, all right. So next questions. Uh, where do you get the microorganisms from, Steve? Um, where do we get the microorganisms? Great. <laughs> Keep saying great question, but, but these are great questions. Um, they actually are naturally occurring. It's already in the, the sewage. So what we do is we provide the right um, conditions um, as far as oxygen concentration, uh, loading rates and things like that, temperatures um, and pH so that we grow the microorganisms that, that work the best. And the activated sledge process was actually invented back in the, the 1800s and has been fine-tuned over the years. So um, there's been a lot of research and we kind of know exactly what the best conditions are. And that's what we try and get because you want the microorganisms to feed on the that does all the organic material, but then when they get to the clarifiers to flocculate and, and settle really well so that we can recirculate them. So, um. Okay, moving on to the next question. Um, do you have any contracts with fertilizer companies? Um, our biggest contracts are with um, the compost uh, companies, uh, Cinegros, one of them. Um, and we, um, Liberty Compost, I think we've, but I think they're also a subsidiary of, of um, Cinegro, but um, we mainly contract with them and then our biosolids get um, composted um, by these third parties and then they are the ones that um, market it to the other um, farmers or whoever that are gonna reuse it. Um, I didn't mention, we also have um, um, the biosolids, we have an energy, um, project with uh, bio, I think it's the Rialto bio, bio energy facility um, where they um, take our biosolids and are producing uh, power there using the biosolid. Okay, thank you. And I'm also getting some questions about, can we take old medications to an HHW event as well? Yes, you can. Paint as well. So you can keep asking me if you can take something and I'll answer them along the way. Um, Okay, we're, we have a few questions left. So if you have any others in mind, please feel free to put them in the Q&A chat and we'll take care of them right now. Okay, so Steve, is mycelium being considered for treatment? Is what? Mycelium, M-Y-C-E-L-I-U-M, -E being considered for treatment? Being, let me look. <laughs> okay, so we'll get back to that one. All right, so the next one, oh, someone asked the HH Roundup 
today is at Rio Hondo College. Yes, it is. So it's in um, it's in Whittier. Um, it starts at nine. So it already started and it ends at 3 p.m. So you still have some time to gather some of your belongings and and take it down there. So I just put it in the I just put it in the chat. Yeah, the, the mycelium, that's a fungus. So I'm not sure if they're, are they asking, or do we use it for treatment? Is that, or? You know, I'm not sure, but Kat, if. if they, they can, can e email us that question and then we can, with some more specifics and we could answer that offline. Okay, all right, cool. So the next one, um, what kind of monitoring is, ooh, this is, this one's good. All right, what kind of monitoring is done for diseases and uh, medications in the sewage? Does the Department of Public Health use this information to monitor infection rates? Um, yes, you can actually go to our website. We've got a link there for the uh, sewer monitoring we, we're doing with the uh, coronavirus. Uh, we started doing that and, um, with, and we also partnered with some universities um, to, to look at that and, and see if there is a way to use um, the concentrations in the wastewater for um, the COVID virus and, and see um, if we could predict um, when there might be surges and things like that. So that data is on our website. Um, and then um, I've also, I don't think we're doing it, but other agencies are also looking at um, the monkey pox. And I think back in New York, they're looking at the uh, state of New York, they've had a polio outbreak. So they've been looking at the wastewater to try and uh, look at that too. So it's definitely um, something we'll um, be able to hopefully use in the future with our laboratory folks to, to um, help the Department of Public Health. All right. Awesome. Um, again, if you guys have any questions and please, please fill out that poll. And if you have any other, if there's anything you'd like to see for the next go around, um, please ask us any other photos that you would want to see, please ask us and we'll try to make it happen for the next one. Um, all right, so how are these uh, projects funded? Um, part of it is um, for like our capital improvement project. Um, we, we try and get um, grant funding when possible from the federal and, and state um, budgets where they have money set aside for infrastructure projects. Um, but then we also um, fund them with uh, low interest loans from both the federal and state agencies. And then um, part of it is also just from, um, you know, our, our normal rates. Um, we have to, even if we get a loan, we still have to pay it off. So it's uh, the rates that we charge our, our users, whether it's a, an industrial user that, that pays to, to, to discharge to our system or um, the residential rates that you'll, you'll see on our um, on your property tax bill, or if you're a renter, it'll get passed on to you through through your uh, monthly rent. All right, so we're on to our last question. If anyone has no other questions, we have some about our water reuse program. So I'm going to put a link in the chat. I know there's so many. <laughs> A whole library. We could probably do like a, a twelve hour talk here if we went through all, all the amazing things that uh, we've got our fingers in. You know. Yeah, so I'm adding another link, yet another one, um, to the chat. It talks about our water reuse program. There are questions about where that water gets reused from our other um, water reclamation plants. Um, it's like places down south as like Cal State Long Beach get that water far east as, you know, in Bonelli, the Bonelli State Park in Laverne, also get some of our recycled water. It's it's pretty cool and you can get more information. Um, we actually have an annual report that talks about all the locations throughout LA County that, you know, benefit from our recycled water. So I put the link there in the chat and if you wanna know more information, please feel free to, um, to check it out. So um, with that, let me see. Um, okay, so someone's asking, um, someone's asking, how do these, okay, well, so actually someone's asking, uh, do all communities get the same service? Um, yes, they, we hope they do. <laughs> they, they, um, each, uh, the way the sanitation districts is set up, and I had that on one of the beginning slides, is um, 
it's not set up by city, it's set up by drainage area. So, um, so there's some sanitation districts that um, overlap, city, city boundaries overlap basically. So it's not each city. And then also some cities are actually in multiple sanitation districts, depending on what their drainage area is. So our um, board of directors for the sanitation districts are actually the mayors uh, or the city council members for the, the cities that we serve. So um, that's who, who basically oversight has oversight and provides direction for us. And then, so if, if we're not providing good service to the cities, we're, we're gonna hear about it. So um, yeah, we try and, um, and do everything equal as far as um, we, we maintain all our sewers in all the cities equally. We, we don't pick and choose and thing, or things like that, if that's what the question is. Um, the, the other thing is the system is set up as a, a regional system. It would be um, way too expensive um, to do, you know, we've got like 78 cities and unincorporated areas of LA County. It'd be uh, way expensive to, to have every city have its own wastewater treatment plant. So um, it's very cost effective and we, we can use economies of scale to, to basically have what, you know, like with this joint outfall system where we're able to, um, you know, do everything, um, a lot of things for, for multiple cities at, at these locations. And like I said, with the joint plant, we're doing the, the solids uh, processing here for 5 million people. So, um, you know, that really saves a, a lot of money. Yeah, so we're very glad when we have you guys come join us and learn about, you know, all of our programs and how it is that we treat your wastewater. And so someone, Melissa, she asked, and this will be for you, Wendy, um, how do these presentations happen? And we'll end with this one. How do these presentations happen? And how do we hear about the next one? Oh, wow. Well, these presentations happen really often <laughs> since the one of the one of the best things of being able to broadcast is that we have a website and I know Genesis will put it in the chat, but we post them, then they are they happen on a monthly basis with our public tours. And we try to rotate between um, different plants and different facilities, and then we record them and put them on YouTube as well. If you want to see us in person, all you need is a group of eight or ten folks, and we will open up that marshland and welcome you to that at any time. Anyone would like to tour the marshland. And if you'd like to come to our facilities, we need to follow all of the safety protocols. But we're working to have outdoor science stations and ways that we can continue to have our tours. As far as the broadcast, those happen regularly and often. Yeah, and they'll be posted on our lacsd.org slash tours. And if you don't want to check the website, you know, too much, you can just follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we also post on Nextdoor. So you can check us out at any one of those. If you visit our website, lacsd.org, it'll give you direct links to all of those. And we like to give at least, you know, at least a few weeks, you know, we'd like to let you know ahead of time so that you can plan accordingly. But yeah, our website is lacsd.org. And if you go to lacsd.org slash tours, you can actually see our entire schedule that we have already for the year. Wendy, you know, puts a lot of thought into, into our tour schedule. So check that out. And if any question comes up later that you forgot to ask, it's never too late. You can send us an email at info at lacsd.org. That'll come to me, that'll come to Wendy. We can forward it to Steve and we'll get that question answered. And with that, we hope to see you at the next one. And remember Bixby will be open next, um, next first Saturday of the month, September 3rd at 8 a.m. So we hope to see you there. Thank you so much for, for joining us and have a good one. Bye. Thanks everybody.